Hello and welcome to Asian Newsweek. I'm Yvonne Yong. Together we'll cover the top stories in the region and go beyond the headlines for a deeper look at Asia. Our top story. Asia has confronted its most powerful storm this year with Typhoon Yagi tearing its way across the region. After hitting the Philippines and China, Yagi made landfall in Vietnam where the death toll has surpassed 200. This is the moment dashcam footage captured a bridge collapsing near Hanoi. Ten vehicles fell into the river. Three people were rescued, with others still missing. Well, the typhoon has also triggered floods and landslides in Thailand, with the cost of the damage yet to be tallied. Angus McIntosh reports. Hundreds dead and millions hit by historic flooding. After tearing a path through China and the Philippines, Super Typhoon Yagi reached winds equivalent to a Category 4 cyclone before striking the Vietnamese coast on Saturday. In Thailand, in the northern city of Chiang Rai, the search for survivors continued through the night. There used to be many floods, but that was back in 1981. The flooding was outside the city, never in the heart of Chiang Rai. Conservation scientists say the country was not adequately prepared for storms made worse by climate change. This also overwhelmed our infrastructure that used to perhaps deal with a much uh, less volume of water. And on top of that, we uh, didn't do well enough in terms of preparedness. In Vietnam, the dead are still being counted as floodwaters recede in the capital of Hanoi. Millions have returned to find their homes damaged and livelihoods destroyed. My household appliances are all destroyed. I'm trying to save whatever is left of my flooded merchandise, but the chances are slim. The damage extends to some of the country's richest farmland and its industrial centres. Some emergency relief has arrived and Australia has pledged $3 million in aid for northern Vietnam. The region still has months of wet conditions ahead. Angus McIntosh, ABC News. To the Philippines, where a preacher who claims he's the owner of the universe has been arrested. Apollo Kiboloi is on the FBI's most wanted list and has been charged with child and sex abuse as well as human trafficking. His church, the Kingdom of Jesus Christ, claims to have six million followers across 200 countries. The preacher's influence extends politically, with Mr Kiboloi enjoying close ties with former President Rodrigo Duterte. Jairo Boledo, justice reporter at Rappler, outlines the current charges against the accused pastor. As early as 2018, 2021, the United States started to investigate Kibuloy because of alleged sexual trafficking of women and children. Um, there are allegations against him that he would sleep with members or women or members of his church and he will force them to sleep with him, citing that if they won't allow him, they will be subjected to eternal damnation. And his church is also being investigated and was also investigated by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and by the United States because of alleged trafficking, because um, Kibuloy and his church would allegedly fly uh, church members from the Philippines to the United States to ask for donation, to work for the church, and so that the church will have enough funds to fund their buildings, their infrastructure, their systems and operations in the Philippines and in the United States. Now, in the Philippines, he faces at least three cases pending in two, um, in two different courts in Metro Manila. He faces um, cases for sexual abuse and uh, child abuse pending in a court in uh, Quezon City in Metro Manila also. And he also faces human trafficking, um, which is pending in, in a passing court, which is also located in Metro Manila. So sexual and child abuse cases of Kibuloy are bailable offenses. It's not considered as a grave offense in the Philippines, but the human trafficking case is a non-bailable offense. And currently, because of the cases that he faces, Kibuloy is currently detained at the Philippine National Police. He's currently at the custody of the National Police of the Philippines. The Pope has wrapped up his 12-day Asia-Pacific tour in Singapore. He urged the wealthy nation to seek fair wages for the country's million-plus lower-paid foreign workers. He also held mass with more than 50,000 Christians at the island state's national stadium. 
But the biggest event in his schedule was an outdoor mass in the world's most Catholic nation outside of the Vatican, Timor-Leste. Citizens were given three days off to attend and it attracted hundreds of thousands of people. Southeast Asia correspondent Bill Bertels was there. This is an extraordinary sight, a sea of humanity. The Vatican estimates there might be as many as 700,000 people attending this celebration of Mass. Even if it's a bit lower than that, it is still an extraordinary scene. And people started arriving here at this site in the west of Dili many hours before Mass began. It was a hot day, but they nonetheless patiently waited to try and see Pope Francis. This is far and away the largest event of his 12-day regional tour. But he has been keeping a very busy itinerary here in Timor-Leste. Earlier today, he met children with disabilities. He spoke at Timor-Leste's largest cathedral. And during this visit, he has also talked about the need to protect children from abuse alluding to a couple of high-profile recent cases here that have rocked Catholicism in Timor-Leste. But far and away, the mood of this visit has been joy, it's been celebration. It's hard to imagine anything he does will compete with this. To Hong Kong now, where lawyers have filed an urgent appeal to the United Nations over Jimmy Lai's treatment. The media mogul has been in jail for more than three years and his prosecution is considered a sign of deteriorating freedoms in the former British colony. East Asia correspondent Kathleen Calderwood has more. Jimmy Lai is one of the most well-known pro-democracy voices in Hong Kong and was the owner of the now shuttered Apple Daily newspaper. He's currently on trial under the national security law with prosecutors alleging he published seditious material and colluded with foreign forces by having meetings with US politicians and calling for sanctions or other actions to be taken against China and Hong Kong. The national security law was imposed by Beijing on Hong Kong following the 2019 protests which went on in the city for months. Uh, those law, that law has been widely criticised but authorities in China and Hong Kong argue it was necessary to restore peace and safety in the city. Now, Mr Lai's international legal team has filed an urgent appeal with the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Torture over concerns they have about Mr Lai's well-being. They say that he is, has been in solitary confinement for more than three and a half years. They say that he gets limited access to daylight and is only given about 50 minutes a day to exercise. They also allege that he has been denied access to independent medical care. Now, Mr Lai is aged 76 and faces life in prison if found guilty. And at his age and suffering from diabetes, there are grave concerns that even a shorter sentence could see him die in jail. Several governments, NGOs and activist groups have condemned the prosecution of Mr Lai. The UK government has called for the release of Mr Lai, who is a British citizen. And in a statement, uh, the British Foreign Office says their Foreign Secretary raised Mr Lai's case in his first meeting with his Chinese counterpart in July. A Thai billionaire allegedly involved in a hit and run which killed a police officer in 2012 has never faced court. Instead, Vora Youth boss Uvidya, who happens to be the heir to energy drink Red Bull, has been jet-setting across the globe. The case is raising doubts over the integrity of the country's justice system. Southeast Asia correspondent Lauren Day joins us now. Lauren, remind us again of what happened back in 2012 that put uh, Vora Youth boss Uvidya in the spotlight and what has transpired since? Well, Yvonne, it was an early morning back in September 2012 on one of the big, busiest roads here in Bangkok, Sukhumvit Road, which if you've ever been to Bangkok, you've probably been out there drinking and partying, when Boss, who was 27 at the time, crashed his Ferrari into the back of a police motorcycle. The officer was thrown from the bike and then dragged under the car for almost 200 metres before Boss sped away. So by the time police arrived at the scene, uh, he was not 
nowhere to be found, but they followed this trail of leaking oil from his Ferrari back to his luxury home. Uh, medical tests were then done and they found traces of alcohol and cocaine in Boss's bloodstream. And police originally accused him of having been travelling at 177 k's an hour in an 80 k zone. So eventually he was charged with five offences, but he just kept failing to meet up with prosecutors. His lawyers would say that he was busy, he was away on business, or he was sick. And it wasn't until 2017, five years after the crash, when he uh, and a warrant was issued for his arrest. And by that time, he had already fled the country, where he has remained ever since on the run. And by all accounts, he's been living the high life as well. He's been travelling around on private jets to Formula One races. He's been snowboarding in Japan, cruising in Venice, all while the family of this police officer who was killed back in 2012 wait for answers and some kind of justice. Well, this week was the first time anyone appeared in court on charges linked to the crash, but it wasn't Boss. That's right. As I mentioned, he's still on the run. But this week, eight people who are accused of helping him escape justice have now finally faced court here in Bangkok at the uh, Misconduct and Corruption Court. Um, they include the former police chief and also the former deputy attorney general. Now, all eight of those people have pleaded not guilty, but the case centres around the decision not to prosecute Boss and also allegations that several of the defendants conspired to change that speed data. As you remember, I said he was travelling, initially accused of travelling 177 k's. That conveniently changed to 79 k's an hour, just under the 80 k speed limit. Now, in 2020, the Office of the Attorney General announced that it was dropping the prosecution against Boss, citing this new evidence that related to the speed data. Shortly after that, the then Prime Minister at the time, Prayut Chanachar, announced a review, an investigation into that decision, which did find that there was a conspiracy from the beginning to shield Boss from any kind of consequences. Uh, but now, finally, a court will examine that and decide if they to agree that this was a conspiracy to protect him from the law. Lauren Day in Thailand, thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. To some headlines from South Asia now. Members of former Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan's party say they've been arrested and detained in midnight raids. A party spokesperson says at least a dozen lawmakers were taken into custody, although police say the number was four. It comes after thousands of people rallied on the outskirts of Islamabad to demand an end to Imran Khan's imprisonment. The former leader has been in jail for more than a year in connection with at least 150 police cases. Critics of the current government say the cases are politically motivated. Protests have erupted in India's Manipur state after six people were killed in a new surge of violence between two warring ethnic groups. Police used tear gas to disperse thousands of student demonstrators as they called for peace and safety in the region. Since May, the Métis and minority Kuki communities have sporadically clashed after a controversial court decision over economic benefits. Authorities have imposed a curfew and blocked internet access to try to bring the latest unrest under control. As voters in Indonesia prepare for regional elections, overdevelopment in Bali has become a hot topic. Politicians are proposing a temporary ban on new tourism builds as the island grapples with an influx of so-called digital nomads and foreign property investors. It's been voted one of the most beautiful beaches in the world. But Bali's Kelinking Beach is about to undergo a controversial transformation. The local village authorities have brought in a Chinese company to build a 182 metre high elevator and viewing platform. Once it's built, would you ride on the glass elevator? No, never. Never? Never. That's how strongly you feel about never. it? Never. Never. Senator and activist Nilu Jalantik is part of a growing pushback in Bali against what she sees as excessive development. And it's Bali's famous rice terraces where the biggest changes are happening. Farmers are giving up, growing rice, very little income, and sell the land, tons of money. 
there's a villa boom taking place, partly fuelled by foreign investors. Conservationists worry that serene inland areas like Ubud might go the way of coastal hotspots like Chenggu, where mega clubs and apartment blocks compete for space. You have a lot of celebrities coming to Bali. Uh, it's like the Asian Ibiza uh, at the moment. So people love it. Sales rep Arthur Richard is from a Ukrainian-owned developer. He says they're employing 900 people and helping Bali's economy. It's a tricky issue for the island's politicians to deal with, given visitors drive up to 80% of Bali's economy. Yes, I, get, I, can, uh, I think it comes back to if there are people who want to come to Bali, we're not going to reject them, as long as visitors who come follow the rules of Indonesia. Development will be in focus as Bali's voters choose a new governor in November. Leaders who will be tasked with trying to preserve the culture and environment of an island that so many people want a piece of. Bill Bertels, ABC News, Bali. And it's not just overdevelopment. Bali's also confronting a traffic problem. Getting from the airport to tourist hotspots only 20 kilometres away can take as long as an hour and a half. The way to fix it? A new underground train has been proposed with the ambitious goal for its first leg to be completed in three years' time. Natasha Salim from ABC's Indonesian team is here to tell us more. Natasha, tell us about why this line is being built. First of all, Yvonne, Bali has a congestion issue. That's what the local told me. So um, they also say that Bali is looking more like Jakarta um, in terms of traffic. Well, it would require you to travel uh, one hour and 30 minutes to get from the airport to Ubud, for example. And the second reason is because um, there are also more people in Bali. There are about 200 thousands foreigners now live in Bali and that's not to mention the number of tourists there as well. And the other reason is because Bali actually wants to get more tourists into it. Um, uh, that's why they offer this solution th that, um, that makes the tourists easier to travel from the airport to touristy areas, to the hotels. But the experts are actually not sure about this because um, to fix the congestion, it it's not just one solution type of thing. It requires a more thorough approach. Mm. How expensive is it going to be to build this line and how extensive will it be? Where will it take you? Um, this project will cost uh, 29 billion Australian dollars and the first phase of this project will take you to um, touristy spots such as uh, Changu, Seminyak and then also Kuta. How will they build this? What is the proposed timeline? Yeah, so um, this project will go into four phases. The government is very keen to complete this project in 2027 or 2028. But again, the experts are not very convinced because they see it as an ambitious project as um, there, there are barely any feasibility studies being done on this. And there, there is also questions about how um, this project could also solve the congestion issue because um, Balinese locals actually like driving their cars and being on their motorbikes. So what do they think then, the locals? Are they quite concerned about this project? Yeah, they're actually concerned. Um, the first one is about the groundwater because in order to do this project you would have to drill into the ground and the second concern is also about whether this project would um, align with the traditional values that the Balinese have when it comes to special planning. Um, but the government is aware of these issues, that's why they're building the train underground. But the question is again whether this um, Bali subway project will actually fix the root of the cause, which is the congestion. And that's something that the experts are not very sure about. Really interesting to talk. Thanks so much, Natasha. Thanks, Yvonne. And that's all we have time for. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.